Hi everyone, so I thought that I would uh, narrate a few of these lectures for you just as an option. Uh, so right now I'm going to uh, narrate the lecture Modern Modes of Seeing and Being, Alfred Stieglitz, Pictorialism and the Photo Secession. Uh, just to let you know, my narration is based directly from the notes that are also in the PowerPoint that you can access in the same exact module that you're, or page that you're looking at. Uh, so just be aware there isn't really anything additional here than uh, the text that is already in the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start with that, and this is just for some of you who uh, might prefer uh, sort of uh, oral learning. Uh, so pictorialism was a style and aesthetic movement that dominated photography during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although there is no standard definition of pictorialism, it is a well-known style in which the photographer has somewhat or somehow manipulated what would otherwise be a straightforward photograph. Typically, a pictorial photograph lacks a sharp focus, tends to be printed in tones ranging from warm browns to deep blues, and quite often brush strokes or other forms of manipulation of the surface of the photograph are visible. For the pictorialist photographer, a photograph is a way of projecting an emotion with the intention to get into the viewer's imagination. It was also a response to a massive and commercialized output of photography, a response to the industrialization of photography. Notes to retain. What is pictorialism and what was it a response to? Two, can you list some of the visual markers of pictorialism? Three, what was the photo secession and who was the leader and what did it aim to do? I just realized I may have earlier or uh, earlier called this the photo recession on accident. So three, what was the photo secession? Who was a leader and what did it aim to do? Four, why did Alfred Stieglitz abandon and change course from pictorialism? So when Alfred Stieglitz came to New York, um, it was really, for him, it was about this like optimism of the vertical city and what is able to be done with that kind of optimism. As he got older, he began to feel that photography still hadn't been elevated to the same level of painting. He felt that photography and painting could not be in the same modernism together. They could not share it in the same space. They were not, they didn't look the same. As he got older, uh, what also happened is that his vision of the city became claustrophobic and uh, to him it became a little bit unrecognizable for what the next step to modernism is. So to summarize, Alfred Stieglitz saw the optimism of a vertical city when he came to New York and he uh, started off by exploring what is possible to be done with that. You see, in 1882, uh, with the patenting of the half-tone process, photographic images began to flourish in print. The half-tone process uh, made it so that photographic prints could be created through the printing press much quicker and cheaper for publication rather than time-consuming engravings. Uh, images are now widely, uh, widely circulating in everyday modern life as stereographs, uh, print publications using the halftone process, and uh, postcards as well. Pictorial artists called for an aesthetic reform. They wanted this reform for the whole of society. Aesthetics are not just limited to the arts, they are uh, really the way we see and process and code visual language. Pictorialists at first began this, uh, began this uh, work by ridding industry from their work, calling for nostalgia, a call for the human hand during a time of massive industrialization. It was an international movement with similar 
groups. There was the Munich Secession, the Vienna Secession, and eventually in the States, a man uh, by the name of Alfred Stieglitz headed the photo secession. In the early days of the pictorialist movement, the key was crafting an image that was just as unique as a painting. How can one do this with the mechanical uh, machine, or with the machine? <laughs> this technical machine of industry, the camera, how can that be done? The photographer could employ creative techniques at the time of shooting in regards to light, lens, staging, or through darkroom manipulation. The intervention of the artist's hand in coordination with the eye and emotion was necessary to create an image that embodied the central ideas of pictorialism. A key figure in pictorialism uh, and the founder of the American Photo Secession, as I mentioned, was Alfred Stieglitz. As a young photographer, Alfred Stieglitz emigrated to the United States from Europe. Stieglitz sought to create effects in photography that also paralleled painting through uh, techniques such as manipulating the tonal range and creating a sense of atmosphere through natural elements and composition. During a changing landscape of industrialism, one can look at these early images uh, by Stieglitz as either romantic, tragic, or hopeful. And this is a painting, actually, by James McNeil Whistler, but I'm showing them side by side. Uh, this is 1897 by Alfred Stieglitz, and this painting is from 1875 uh, to show you this sort of idea of photography mimicking this uh, sort of uh, these effects that parallel painting. With him, uh, Stieglitz brought a European uh, sensibility for painting, or I should say a sensibility for European painting. Uh, and this is evident in his very, very early works. This photograph is dated to 1890. Eventually in the 1890s though, Stieglitz images began to focus more on form rather than atmosphere. Stieglitz's sense of the openness and possibility of the new world and of a new age. This is 1902. Alfred Stieglitz, who was in a prominent position with non-pictorialist camera clubs, had already amassed a following of a lot of pictorialist photographers, both in the United States and in Europe. He adopted the word secession as in seceding from conventional academic work, and in 1902, he formally launched the photo secession. Emphasizing the American artistic expression while accepting mostly modern European art movements, he actually published a periodical called Camera Work between the years of 1903 to 1917, as well as open a uh, gallery called Gallery 291. So the object of the photo secession is to advance photography as applied to pictorial expression, to draw together those Americans practicing or otherwise interested in the art, and to hold from time to time at varying places exhibitions not necessarily limited to the productions of the photo secession or to American work. And this is literally, uh, I would say, the, the, the manifesto, the mission statement, or the manifesto of the secession word by word. Uh, these factions uh, really actually uh, open up dialogue about what the frameworks of photography should be as an art form. Uh, like, for example, was it just a graphic expression? If one views the claims of these factions as claims of attempting certainty and opposition to uncertainty, then all of these movements can open up dialogue, debating the modes of photography. 
Uh, so future movements are formed in response. So this photo secession is this attempt at sort of uh, creating some kind of a guideline or drawing a line of some kind of a certainty. It doesn't mean permanence. Steiglitz believed that the human uh, emotions, feelings, and experiences could be conveyed through shapes, lines, and composition, uh, otherwise known as formal elements. He created this image called the steerage in 1907, uh, first out of interest in the forms and shapes. Uh, and an epiphany had occurred to him, which was that he could convey these things through formal shapes. This photograph is from 1911. So over here, he's sort of trying to find his vision in this uh, vertical city and trying to sort of how do you reconcile the individual and the hand of the photographer as a fine art form uh, through a, a machine of industry and with an industrialization. And this image is from 1915. And this image is actually by Paul Strand. So at some point in 1916, uh, after uh, founding the photo secession and advocating for pictorialism, Stieglitz actually decides that photography and painting are in fact anti, uh, antithetical. Uh, that it was not a function, I'm quoting him right now, that it was not a function of photography to give aesthetic pleasure, but to provide visual truths about the world. So Stieglitz overthrows pictorialism for purism, favoring a new style, that of what we call straight photography. This hard edge straight photography was not quite synonymous with uh, photographic modernism, but it embodies its first American manifestation. In his very last publication of camera work, Stieglitz publishes a photograph by Paul Strand. Uh, Paul Strand was a photographer whose work to Stieglitz embodied this straight photography. And ironically, this very image that you're looking at by Paul Strand uh, was the cover of the very last issue of camera work. Meanwhile, Stieglitz's own work shifted from the windowscapes uh, of New York and the urbanscapes to the series called Equivalence in the late 1920s and 1930s. Uh, the author of the book, Andy Grumberg, views these pieces as representing the climax of Stieglitz's work, a radical demonstration of faith in the existence of a reality behind and beyond that offered by the world of appearances intended to function evocatively like music. And I believe I'm quoting uh, the textbook there. And this image is from 1923. A desire to leave behind the physical world, a desire symbolized by the virtual absence of horizon and scale, uh, Clues within the frame. Uh, emotion, and this is a quote, emotion resides solely in form, they assert, not in the specifics of time and place, but their extreme abstraction poses a dead end rather than a solution, according to the author, uh, but yet perhaps it exits one out into the sky. So Stieglitz creates these works called equivalents at this very same time he was also dealing uh, with some issues of, uh, of, morality, of uh, mortality, I should say. And so this idea that shapes and forms that he initially started with could maybe convey some kind of feelings and emotions and ideas is now reflected into these sort of abstract like sky uh, clouds, photographs of clouds. Um, and so we're not really quite sure if this abstraction really poses a solution to what he was looking for, but more of an exit from what he had been advocating for. Although Grumberg calls Stieglitz equivalents the climax of his work, he shifts his focus to, quote, the real center of his work, the sensual and sexually charged portraits of women he made throughout his career. 
uh, unquote. Grunberg finds uh, these images, in his own words, to be direct, unflinching confrontations with the female presence as characteristic of the purest spirit. So Grunberg really sees that Alfred Stieglitz's images of uh, of of the of, of woman of the female form is kind of ultimately what's defining uh, this era or this modernism. That this is actually where Alfred Stieglitz's search is, or the answer to it is. Grunberg compares these images with those of Edward Weston's uh, portraits and nudes from the same era. So this image that you're looking at is 1935 Edward Weston nude on sand. Um, Grunberg sees them both as both as that quote direct and flinching confrontations with the female presence as characteristic of the purest spirit. Uh, so perhaps uh, the Grunberg is saying this is where that purity is it's in these images in these forms and here is uh from 1933 that same era alfred stieglitz uh photograph titled georgia o'keefe's hand on a back tire of ford v8 in this picture from 1933 i've quoted 1935 in the text um georgia o'keefe actually a, a well-known painter it's her hand on a steering wheel of a super shiny brand new v8 car is kind of typical it romanticizes the machine but in the process it dehumanizes the human hand as a result a sense of closure replaces the sense of openness and possibility found in the early pictures of new york streets and harbor Now, a counterpoint of the equivalence would uh, I, I want to present would be that, uh, and I just want to mention that it's a uh, counterpoint would be that he emphasized, I'm quoting, pure abstraction, adhering to the modern ideas of equivalence, holding that abstract forms, lines, and colors could represent corresponding inner states, emotions, and ideas. So I suppose you could look at this counterpoint when looking at this series equivalents as uh, is it really uh, posing that sort of a corresponding inner state within a modern era? Here's another one of Alfred Stieglitz's equivalents from 1929. Equivalents from 1931. And this is Two Towers, just to bring it back to this, from 1911. Another remarkable counterpoint to Steglitz's ability to drop things, uh, in, uh, or I should say another remarkable counterpoint is uh, Steglitz's ability to drop things and move on to the next movement. For example, how quickly Stieglitz accepted and even promoted Paul Strand's straight photography in the photo secession marking its very end. Uh, in a way you could kind of see uh, or even view Alfred Stieglitz as a sort of like David Bowie of photography. He's able to transform and move on to the next, even if that means dropping his own previous assumption and realizing it's time to move on. And I think that's quite remarkable. Grumberg says that or views it, he Grum, Grumberg's approach to it is, but he may have also, but he may also have finally sensed the underlying contradiction in his own art. Although he never stopped trying to find visual means to reconcile the romantic worldview he carried over from the 19th century with his faith in 20th century progress, his attempts carry less and less conviction. So there's a sort of tension or the struggle of how to reconcile these two. Um, uh, 
And uh, Grumberg sees that this conflict uh, between tradition and the new is something that is essentially embedded within modernist art. And he really sees Steiglitz photographs as uh, really kind of being a full sort of form example of this tension and this uh, struggle between tradition and the new. So through Steiglitz's image, you could see uh, sort of in a way both sides of that tension. So to summarize, Alfred Steiglitz saw the optimism of a vertical city when he came to New York, and he explored what is able to be done with that. As he got older, he began to feel that photography still hadn't been elevated to the same level as painting. Uh, he felt that photography and painting could not be in the same modernism together. His vision of the city also became more claustrophobic as he got older. Uh, and Andy Grumberg sees this step is irreconcilable for what the next step to modernism would be. What do you think? So to summarize, notes to retain, one, what is pictorialism and what was it a response to? Two, can you list some of the visual markers of pictorialism? Three, what was the photo secession? Who was the leader and what did it aim to do? And four, why did Alfred Stieglitz abandon and change course from pictorialism?